Pan 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 Psychast. Part two: further analysis and discussion. Guys, this is our. Christmas episode essentially because it's two days before Christmas where this is airing. Um, are, you, are we in the festive spirit, Ollie? Jingle bells are ringing. G- good, Greg. Oh, it's such a there's snow everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Six feet deep outside. <laughs> it's so hard to get here. <laughs> How's the snow in New York, Sky? Yeah, it's still snowy in New York. I've still got yeah a bit of snow piled up outside. Uh, so I thought we'd uh, that's quite inauthentic of us, isn't it <laughs> we're just lying to listeners uh, we're recording this in late November sorry to ruin the festive cheer for everybody oh no there really is snow here in New York oh there is actually <laughs> there oh is. really yeah. yeah it yeah it snowed really heavily last week oh there you go okay well at least you were being authentic <laughs> yeah, we were <laughs> okay we were living in bad faith yeah. so uh Sky, uh, what's it mean to live life authentically or be authentic in one's actions? We've spoken a lot about existentialism in previous episodes. And in part one there, we're saying, you know, as long as this person is, is embracing this romantic love authentically and trying to stay true to their radical freedom, then it, it, we shouldn't frown upon these relationships. But what do we mean when we say uh, be authentic in one's actions? Yeah, so what I mean by authenticity is choosing in accordance with what you think is right for you and not Mm. because you're being pressured into doing something or because you think you should do something. So to bring up an example, um, marriage. Mm. You know, we all, there's, there is this pressure in, you know, both Eastern and Western societies that uh, we're expected to get married or it's the normal narrative to get married. Um, but and if we go into it and just say and just accept that blindly and go ahead and do it without truly reflecting on it and reflecting on whether it's right for us, then that's to be inauthentic. Mm. But I mean, it doesn't mean that you can uh, you can still reflect on uh, getting married. And if you decide, yep, that's that's right for me. I want to say a Nietzschean yes to life or a kicky. Kick a guardian leap to to duty and marriage, mm. and give that a go. Then you know you can still do what society is ch- channeling you into doing. But the important thing is to reflect on whether it's the right thing for you. So uh, we've just finished a, a four part series on Simone de Beauvoir, in which we do a whole uh, kind of episode on the second sex. Um, and it took me about two months, but I managed to read the whole thing. Um, and it's, it's an absolutely fantastic book with lots to say about. Um, you know, obviously women in society. Um, And in that book, Simone de Beauvoir argues that women have to be free from oppression in order to love authentically. So how can women love authentically, Sky, if they are under some form of uh, patriarchal oppression? Is it possible? Well, Simone de Beauvoir was sceptical that it's possible. Mm. Her goal was for us to be able to choose a range of options and have open futures. So she said, if we're choosing from, you know, a couple of options within a patriarchal, like oppressed society, then that's not really choosing authentically because our options are so limited. Um, and but she's like, she says that uh, women have gone along with the patriarchy um, because it's been, you know, a rational thing to do. Um, But the problem is in loving relationships. She argues that love is too often an escape from being independent and an excuse not to try things in life. And this is why in The Second Sex, one of her big calls to action is for women to stop accepting their oppression, for men to stop oppressing women, and for women to just stop going along with um, the falling into the traditional gender roles. Um, And... So for in existentialism, there are no excuses. So for Simone de Beauvoir, authentic loving can only be achieved when the people involved are equal and they're independent. Now, I think what she means by that is that the people can potentially be independent Mm -hmm. because when we come together in a relationship, 
of course, you're going to be dependent on one another for certain things. Um, and that's okay. You know, maybe someone does the laundry, so maybe someone else does the shopping, you know, and we depend on one another for these things. So it's not being completely independent, but being financially independent was a really important step for her because she said that without financial independence, if uh, a couple breaks up or gets divorced, then you know the woman is left um, in poverty potentially, mm. especially mm. when she was writing in the 1950s. Women's participation in the workforce was much lower, so it was a much greater risk um, for women if the relationship were to break up. Uh, so for Simone de Bois, she says, yeah, authentic relationships are about a reciprocal recognition of two freedoms. It's where the people in the relationship recognize themselves as self and other, and they transcend together. Uh, so, Sky, one of the main themes in uh, existential thought is anguish, right? Uh, Sartre has this example of you're having anguish in the face of the future and having anguish in the face of the past, right? Yeah, I'm my identity isn't secure and I'm aware of it. Or oh, and then I'm aware of also that the things that I've set myself to do or the way to behave, it's completely open to me. I could I could completely throw those to one side. And this is what the source of anguish is. Is there a specific type of anguish associated with romantic love or does it come down for most existentialists to the other forms of anguish that they think there are? So take take Sam Sartre as the prime example. Right. So I think Jean-Paul Sartre would say it's a similar kind of anxiety that you experience in other situations. Mm. Um, and he talks specifically about when we're in love, uh, the goal of love is to control the other person or to capture their freedom so that we can understand mm. what they think of us so that we can have full knowledge about ourselves and become complete. But of course, we can never become complete until we die. Um, but in romantic relationships, this causes a uh, certain kind of dynamic, similar to Hegel's master-slave dynamic, in which we're always trying mm. to either possess the other person or be subservient to the other um, so that they can merge with us. Um, and this, and he talks about how the goal of love is to unite with the other person, to find out the secrets mm -hmm. that they hold about us. Um, but it's a special kind of possession. So we don't want to force the other person to love us. And if we completely control them, then they would lose their objectivity. So rather, he says, we want to possess our lover in their freedom. We want our lover to love us mm. freely. But the problem is that if we're free to love, then we're free to leave the other person and we're free to love someone else. Mm. So this is why Sartre reduces love. He says love is a project of being loved. And we engage in these kind of sadistic and masochistic games in order to try and get the other person to love us. But ultimately, he says love is impossible we can't achieve the ideal and merge with the other person because there's no real basis to connect with the uh, with another person. And in one of Sartre's stories called The Room, um, the husband Pierre mm -hmm. says to his wife Eve, he's like, there's a wall between you and me. I see you, I speak to you, but you're on the other side. You know, what keeps us from loving? And Sartre says, at least in being in nothingness, he says that we tend to get stuck in this cycle. And so love is doomed to conflict. So in fact, love, he says, contains the seed of its own destruction. So anxiety is like basically infused throughout Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, idea of love. An interesting thing you raise in the book um, around Jean-Paul Sartre and de Beauvoir is kind of an ad hominem argument, this uh, criticism against the people themselves. And it's really interesting because the existentialists say this is a philosophy you should live out. So it's quite an interesting criticism. Um, one of uh, Sartre's lovers saying that uh, Sartre, um, the waiter played at being a waiter and Sartre played at being a romantic lover. Um, in our Simone de Beauvoir episode, uh, you can tell we're fresh out of doing our de Beauvoir episode. Uh, we spoke about the Me Too movement and perhaps what uh, Beauvoir would think about the abuse of power that in particular powerful white men in Hollywood and politics have exercised over women for their own gain. And I, arg I, and I argued that regardless of whether it was physical or psychological, 
um, Simone de Beauvoir would object to these men and their actions because they're kind of infringing on the autonomy and using their power um, to take away that freedom from these uh, individuals. And But the interesting thing is de Beauvoir and Sartre had lots of relationships with students. And I quote one of their students here, uh, Bianca, who uh, Simone de Beauvoir was teaching her when Bianca was just 17 years old. And she was, and I quote, um, uh, the brilliant, piercing, bold intelligence, unquote, of her teacher um, you know, made her, I guess, fall in love in a sense. Um, but when Bianca had this relationship with them, um, she kind of accuses uh, Simone de Beauvoir of pimping her out to Sartre or something like this. And a 17-year-old, um, I don't think we're hard pushed to argue it's too controversial for me to say that a 17-year-old is very impressionable to the power of someone with such great intelligence as Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre. So ha can we fledge a, an, an ad hominem criticism against Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre? Are they themselves not living out the philosophy which they prescribe to everybody else? Are they living in... Um, are they... What's the word I'm looking for? Were well, they restricting others' freedom through their own freedom? Are, are they themselves restricting other people's freedom um, through their own freedom, going against what de Beauvoir says in The Ethics of Ambiguity? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think it was an abuse of power in those relationships because mm. they're in a student-teacher relationship. Teacher has power over that student and so I do mm -hmm. think that was problematic um, and so I and I think you could potentially bring in an ad hominem argument here that that's they weren't living their philosophy but you know often they said we're not we're not being authentic we're not living our philosophy and I right. think they were intellectually honest to say they did make mistakes and they didn't mm -hmm. always live up to their philosophy but they were trying things out. They, they were trying to create a philosophy to be lived. And in order to do that, you know, they, they did make mistakes. And I, I think mm. that was one of them. And I, I don't think it was right. Um, and not only Simone de Beauvoir falling in love with uh, her students, but also, I guess, then, you know, passing them on to Jean-Paul Sartre to have a relationship. I mean, there's something very problematic mm. about that. Um, however, I do think that Simone de Beauvoir would have been completely on board with the Me Too movement. She would have not been surprised about um, these men continuing to abuse power in, over women um, in these ways. Um, can, I, can I jump in here with a, yes. a follow-up? Um, so if Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir can't do it, what hope does the everyday Jack or Jill on the street have? You know, they Are we... Uh, destined to be living in bad faith? If these great existentialists can't do it, can we? I think that's a really good question. Um, no, and But the existential, I guess, idea is that we all have to work it out for ourselves. It's There's no prescription. Mm. You know, the existentialists are like, well, no, don't follow me. Don't just do what I do. You know, we're giving you maybe a framework to think about things differently, uh. but it's up to you to go ahead and work that out for yourselves. Like don't just blindly follow what someone else is telling you to do because that wouldn't be authentic. Mm. So these uh, philosophies you outline in the book, they're not prescriptions. It's not saying go and do this. It's just describing the way things are. And then it's, okay, there are the tools for your thinking now and go and what you make of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And and this is one of the reasons why I mentioned before that they um, wrote in, uh, they wrote novels and they wrote extensive mm. letters to one another they published and diaries and autobiographies. And one of the reasons they did this was to think about philosophies through their own experience and to connect with other people and to be in conversation with other people about what life is like or what existence is like and how it should be like um, but not to give like a, a doctrine as to exactly oh follow these steps yeah i think people would be quite sh well simone de beauvoir and sartre would be quite shocked if people were kind of ignoring what they were writing and just following what they did themselves they're not supposed to be kind of followed in the in that sense are they mm. um okay so move, so kind of expanding on that then so here's a thought uh, simone de beauvoir in the ethics of ambiguity teaches us to will the freedom of ourselves and others in fact she argues that this is an objective moral principle that we should all live in accordance with However, if we are the object of other people's love, are we in danger of taking away their freedom? So, you can tell Jack's written this for me. In an alternative <laughs> universe, universe, I might be really attractive and charming, and therefore lots of people might find me attractive. They might want to be my husband or wife. 
I become their purpose, their reason for being. Can I be morally uh, culpable for the way I look and act, morally speaking? In short, where do we draw the line in terms of infringing on the freedom of others? Thanks, Jack. <laughs> no, that was for me originally. You're attractive oh, right, okay. and charming in this universe. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> so I think Beauvoir was undecided on where to draw that line. In some places she says um, in one of her novels, like there's this woman who's deeply in love with this guy who doesn't really love her back, but, you know, he likes her, but, you know, he loves her, but he's not in love with her. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and mm. and he, that character does wonder, he's like, you know, to what extent am I responsible for her? Because, you know, to what extent can she choose to be in love with me? And so she does hint in there towards a responsibility towards other people who are in love with you. But at the same time, she doesn't go all the way. She doesn't say that there's a clear responsibility. Um, but I think she does say that, you know, there's certainly a care that we should um, take with other people. She says that we're like stones in an arch that no pillars support. So mm. we're, we're not isolated individuals all over the place, but we depend on one another in society. Mm. Um, now, she's quite different to Sartre on this. And, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre would say, yes, we're always trying to seduce the other person. We're always trying to get control over mm. the other. And flaunting ourselves like peacocks, uh, he talks about him being a nothingness, that's a natural and normal, maybe not natural, but normal part of being in relationships. And that's why his view was that relationships are always going to be intention you know love is tension mm -hmm. now Simone de Beauvoir thought that we can overcome that tension um, and with a foundation of friendship um, we can respect one another's freedom and not try and possess them um, whereas Sartre was very skeptical at least in being a nothingness he was skeptical that we could ever escape that cycle of, of sadomasochism but what's interesting is that later when he wrote uh, notebooks for an ethics he does make some mm. suggestions to say that, well, maybe, I mean, he doesn't say maybe Simone de Beauvoir was right, but he says uh, things along <laughs> those lines that maybe there is a possibility for authentic love. Maybe we can overcome the sadistic, masochistic cycle of love. But he also said maybe that will be to overcome love itself. So he thought that that uh, tension in love was so integral to being in love. So he was skeptical that we could overcome it in a way that Simone de Beauvoir was much more positive. Mm. And how do you, in, in Notebooks for an Ethics, does he say how he, he yeah, why he thinks we could overcome it? Or is that just like a statement kind of thing? Does he kind of give an explanation for that? Yeah. Um... I can't remember exactly, but uh, I will say this. So Notebooks for an Ethics was just that, and notebooks. Um, he promised that he mm. would write uh, a book on ethics. He never fully did it. So this is as close as he got to that. So really it's just it's fragments of his thinking on that, and he doesn't, um, he doesn't explain it in great detail. So unlike Jean-Paul Sartre, we'll stick to our promises and ask some listener questions. Um, we received lots of <laughs> listener questions over online. So apologies if you haven't, if you won't have your question uh, asked here. Remember, for all of our future guests, we want to hear from you guys. So please submit your questions, thepansycast.com. You can find a list of all our upcoming guests there. And there's always a segment at the end where we'll ask some listener questions questions this is where the listener questions jingle will go again if there's no listener questions jingle i haven't made one um do you want to kick us off ollie sure so our first question comes from sabina pilchova from the czech republic uh and they ask from what i've been taught about existentialism it would lead me to believe that it values tragic heartbreak rather than a happy ending so sky yeah is that so is it the uh, tragic heartbreak over the happy So ending? I see how Sabina might get that impression um, because the existentialists weren't soppy romantics and perpetuating this myth of finding the one and living happily ever after. Uh, Kierkegaard in Either Or says, oh, his pseudonym writes, when two people fall in love and suspect they're made for each other, the thing is to have the courage to break it off for by continuing, they only have everything to lose and nothing to gain. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> however, that was written by a pseudonym. So Kierkegaard was writing to challenge us to reflect on our relationship. So it wasn't his last word on that, as I mentioned in part one. Um, so 
to go back to the question, I don't think um, they value tragic heartbreak over a happy ending, but I think they question what we mean when we say happy ending. Are we talking about getting married and settling down with a soulmate? Well, if so, that's a very tenuous sort of happy ending given the number of people who get divorced or are, and are in unhappy marriages. Um, so the existentialists recognize that heartbreak can be really painful, but also that mm. it's an everyday part of existence. It's it's an inherent risk of opening yourself up to someone in love, and it's a, just a risk of being in a relationship. And even if you do live a long, happy life together, which is wonderful and beautiful, there's always death at the end. Death is always imminent. And Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, who had this lifelong relationship, um, when Sartre died, Beauvoir, who was an atheist, um, wrote that uh, his death separates us and my death won't bring mm -hmm. me and Sartre back together again. That's the fact of life. That's how it is. And it's splendid that we were able to live our lives in harmony for so long. And so what Simone de Beauvoir says is that harmony is never given, but we always have to work for it. And it's the same with happy endings. You know, they're never given. Happiness is never a fixed state, but we always have to work for good relationships. Thank you for your question, Sabina. Our next question comes from Matthias Kendley uh, from Hungary over on Patreon. He says, hi, Dr. Cleary. My question is, to whom should we be authentic? If existence precedes essence, meaning if we are constantly creating ourselves, there is no fixed self, to what do we owe authenticity? That's a really good question. So, so existence precedes essence. Yeah, it means that we're here, we're thrown mm. into existence, and then we're free to choose who we become. So we're free to create our essence. So when the existentialists talk about no fixed self, what they mean is there's no fixed essence. However, there are parts of our existence that are fixed. I mean, just think about our, mm. our blood type, our genes, our hair color, although we can change some of those more superficial things. Um, and also for the existential philosophers, authenticity isn't a goal that's actually achievable, but it's a journey. It's a continuous process of self-creation and it's a receding goal in a way, forever elusive. Um, so I don't think we owe it to anybody. We don't even owe it to ourselves to be authentic, but the existentialist thought that life tends to be better. Life tends to be richer, not necessarily happier though, um, if we act in ways that are meaningful for us. As Jean-Paul Sartre said, he wasn't authentic. He was just showing the way to others. Um, Beauvoir was the one who really talked a lot more about authenticity. And she thought that not to strive to being becoming authentic is kind of tantamount to committing metaphysical suicide because it's not really living. It's not really being. It suggests either we're living on autopilot or we're just being channeled into life and going with the flow, doing what other people or our situations are pushing us into. Um, but to provide another perspective, um, Max Stirner hmm. says that we should just accept ourselves. We should be happy just the way we are. We don't ever need to be anymore. However, uh, most of us enjoy taking an interest in ourselves, doing things that we're interested in. Um, and he says that I am my own only when I am master of myself. So he recommended being self-determining and self-creating and you know, reflecting on choosing for our own sake and on our own terms, not because we're being coerced to it. But he also says that most people aren't like that. And Matthias says, uh, perhaps if you have time and chance, here is another question too. Simone de Beauvoir wrote in The Ethics of Ambiguity that our final end should be freedom itself. Could this be interpreted as we need to be constantly aware of ourselves, our situation and reflect on it so we can have the most information about it in order to be able to make decisions as freely as possible without being deceived, biased, etc. If not, how else should we understand this? Thank you very much. So I think that's right, reflecting on our situation and being aware of ourselves so that we're making informed and conscious decisions about our life is definitely mm. part of that freedom. Simone de Beauvoir also says that if we value freedom for ourselves, then we value it for others too. So it's not only important for us to have the freedom to choose our course in life, but it's important to support other people in being able to freely choose their futures too. 
And Simone de Beauvoir says that being free in that sense doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we like. It's not like Dostoevsky who said, if God is dead, then anything goes. Rather, we're Mm. all part of the human collectivity and we depend on others and we share the world with other people and we depend on one another for survival. So I would say that political activism is very much implicit in Beauvoir's ideas of freedom. So yes, it's that individual aspect that the listener brought up, but also there's a collective aspect to it as well. Okay, Sky. So we've got a question here from Tash Lu on Twitter. So thank you for your question, Tash. What does existentialism say about ways to maintain romantic love in a long-term relationship? In other words, how do we keep the love alive? So how to make love stay is one of these eternal questions. Um, So it Hmm. seems to be the case that these crazy, lusty passion hormones calm down somewhere between six months and a couple of years. Um, And we're also surprised because when you're in love, it does feel like it's going to be forever. And we spend all this time kind of chasing the dragon of love, trying to get that, trying to get back that original high. Um, mm. So neuroscience is showing that these dopamine and other hormones are to blame um, for this volatility, but philosophers have always known this is the case. And it's no surprise that I think about Kierkegaard's uh, Johannes the seducer who kept his relationships to a strict six month limit. Um, and Nietzsche also says that sensuality often makes love grow too quickly so that the root remains weak and is easy to pull out. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, Nietzsche thought it was crazy that we would want to marry for love. Um, but he thought we should just take love a uh, marriage a whole lot more seriously than we do and accept that it's okay if a relationship evolves into something else like friendship or marital love and it may not be as exciting but that's okay and maybe it's exhausting to keep that um sort of early stages of passion going throughout your whole life that takes up a lot of uh, time and energy um So I spoke with um, Esther Perel, who's a relationship psychotherapist, who Mm. she's read a lot of the existential philosophers and, you know, her psychotherapy is very much informed by existentialism. And she wrote a book recently about why people have affairs. And she says it's because they tend to find an aliveness and a vitality that they don't always have or that they've lost in their long-term relationships. And you know, if that's the case, then I think there are ways to kind of reinvigorate love or romantic kind of feelings with the person who we're in long-term relationships. And part of that is realizing that no one's perfect. Try Let's try and avoid putting a lover on a pedestal because we're going to be less crushed when we realize they're not the perfect mm. person we thought it would they would be. Um, and you know, let's try not to just define a relationship by passion. You know, think about what other projects mm. and goals or adventures that people can work towards together. And this was something Beauvoir emphasized as well. Um, and shift the focus, not just from finding a relationship or finding the one, but creating a relationship together and know that relationships aren't static things it's not just like oh we get married oh we can relax now everything's good no (laughs) a happy ending isn't something you can achieve and then relax but we need to make sure that we're always active participants in our relationships we're all condemned to be alone as philosophers anyway (laughs) so (laughs) Um, i think we'll uh, wind down with some concluding remarks here um greg can i throw you on this under the under the pedestal Um, what are my concluding remarks and what will I go away and think about? Um, so I have a question for you, Sky, if that's okay. Another sure. question. What does Hannah Arendt think about uh, existentialism and romantic love? Because her PhD thesis was on love in Aquinas, I think it is, or St. Anselm or something. Uh, do, so do you know anything about what Arendt thinks about love? Yeah, I haven't taken, um, I haven't spent much time with Hannah Arendt. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. I'll come up with something better to say. <laughs> <completely> <laughs> do, you, do you want to jump over to Do you want me to go first? Um, Ollie, do you want to kick us off with some uh, concluding remarks? 
Yeah, thank you very much for for joining us today, Sky. Um, this is this has been a fantastic interview. Um, Existentialism, Romantic Love, your book was my first kind of uh, introduction to reading about um, love in the philosophical sense, uh, and I'm a little bit embarrassed really because I can't believe that it's taken me this long to get onto this topic because I think love is something that's it's all around us. It's it's something that people talk about all the time. That's on the TV all the time. That people constantly uh, talk about and think about, but maybe not in in the philosophical sense and what i really enjoyed about your book was that it just really clearly um you know explained obviously the five philosophical uh, crit- criticisms of romantic love uh, and i agree with you i think that actually a lot of m- most people's expectations of romantic love is very very unrealistic and, and certainly not most people's experience of love um so just thank you very much for just writing a really fantastic book um and you know i really really got inspired to read much more Simone de Beauvoir so i'm going to pick up a copy of the mandarins hopefully for christmas and uh, find out a little bit more i might have got you one already ollie you never know oh thanks Jack. Well, christmas Sorry. is only two days away so you better bought it now <laughs> <laughs> i'm running to the shop straight after this <laughs> yeah. um i want to echo ollie's um points as well i think it's an absolute pleasure speaking with you um we've spoken a lot about existentialism and we know that our listeners are really interested in existentialism because it can be applied to their lives it's a philosophy that you live out and just as uh, your books really made me reflect on Uh, I think I've come to realize that my expectations of love are perhaps unrealistic and what I should do to live, uh, have more authentic relationships. And that's really important because here we see philosophy uh, baking bread out there in the world. Um, So, yeah, I think and I encourage everybody to go away and and pick up this book or perhaps try and try and win one on, on a competition because we can learn a lot about how we treat the person closest to us. Um, so when we're thinking about how we should act, let's start with that person who who we love and then work on from that. Um, so I'm, I'm mixing my thoughts up here. Let me, um, what's the main thing I was going to say? Yeah, and it's been something which we've wanted to speak about for a while because we've spoken about Simone de Beauvoir and, the, and uh, her relationship with Sartre. And back in our Camus episode, we were speaking about how Camus um, was a bit more promiscuous as well outside. And I remember mentioning in that episode, what is it about these existentialists that they can't just <laughs> seem to... I, I would describe them as liberal at the time. <laughs> That's um, very generous of you, Jen. And Kierkegaard as well. So it's a theme which goes through them. And it's been fantastic to, to read through your book and get to discuss these ideas with you today, Sky. So thank you again. Greg, have you come to uh, have have the thought? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for speaking to us, Guy. It's been really interesting. I've uh, really enjoyed it, and uh, reading the book was also uh, you know, really interesting. So, one of the things I find interesting about what, you, what you've told us and what's in the book is kind of we're always living in bad faith, and even in all these relationships and these endeavors we are, and we're in bad faith. And in some way, that's bad, right? But also, it's kind of you know reassuring because if we can't escape being in bad faith, and we can only try to kind of better be aware of the uh, the situation we find ourselves in and tr- strive to be uh, more authentic or something like this, well, that's kind of you know takes the pressure off a little. And um, so I think that's what I'll take away from it this and um i think what i'll go away and think about more and kind of try look into more is this the kind of the sadomasochistic relationship that you talked about in sartre and how that kind of plays out great um can i say something <laughs> um go ahead yeah no i guess i just i wonder if we are always in bad faith i i don't know that i would go so far i would say Often we do slide into bad faith, but it doesn't mean we're always there. And um, it's part of being human, maybe, to constantly reflect on ways that we might be acting in bad faith or or not being authentic. And so that's, but that's part of like the process. But I don't think we're always there. And Jack, something you mentioned something Mm. about how philosophers are doomed to be alone. I would just yes, (laughs) that's my worry anyway. From this, I picked up the book because I I was worried I'd fall victim to the same uh, plague as the rest of the great philosophers. Not to put myself in the same basket of them, of course. Yeah, maybe I'm that bad a philosopher. I'll manage to to get there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So just on that, I would say I don't know if you can uh, add that add something, but I would say. Mm. Well, Jean-Paul Sartre said, if you're lonely when you're alone, you're in bad company. Ah, good. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> you can go away and think about that, Jack. Yeah. No, I do. I do. Um, go, sorry, go on, Sky. 
Yeah, and I was also going to say that I, I okay, so I worry that this is ending on a like negative note. <laughs> <laughs> so can I respond to that? Mm, sure. <laughs> Try and get us in the Christmas spirit of of love and and rather than this pessimism which I've clouded my, over. My, mine was positive. Mine's <laughs> yeah, was, it was was positive. positive. Yeah. <laughs> my, mine's positive. I'm, I'm saying you know, um, <laughs> going to spend Christmas on my own. <laughs> 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 so existentialism has a reputation for being negative, but hmm. I think Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre both rejected that. I mean, Beauvoir said existentialism is the opposite of doom and gloom. But rather, it's exciting and it's liberating because mm-hmm. it puts our destiny back into our own hands. And sure, it, it's um, anxiety-inducing, having to choose and having to take responsibility for everything in our life. But it's also exciting. You know, we get to choose the meaning in our lives through our projects. And for the existentialists, you know, the question is not whether life is worthwhile, but how should we live? And that's what makes existentialism particularly a living philosophy. And one of the most important things I think that existential philosophies can teach us is the acknowledgement that we probably will have our heart broken. We probably will be disappointed by love and there is anxiety bound up in that. But they also recognize that love is one of the most incredible and beautiful experiences in our life. It can enrich us. It helps us become better people. It can reveal deeper dimensions of our being. And basically, our world takes on greater meaning through loving other people. Good. Okay. I'll stop hanging around the philosophy section of bookshops waiting for this uh, pedestal of a (laughs) a woman to fall into my life. Um, So at the end of each episode, uh, Sky, we play a quick quiz. Are you up for playing one with us today? Sure. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. Okay, so um, it's pop, pop, philosophy quiz, and we're playing Sky's Dreaming of a White, White Christmas. Uh, so we've got quotations from Sky Cleary, the philosopher and author of Existentialism and Romantic Love. We've got quotes from Skylar White, the fictional character in Breaking Bad, uh, <laughs> who's portrayed by Anna Gunn. Um, she actually won two, uh, what's this, two consecutive Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting uh, Actress. So well done, um, Anna Gunn. <laughs> and we've got quotes from Paula White. Now, Paula White is best known uh, as the American non-denominational pastor. Um, she's the senior pastor of the New Destiny Christian Center, and which is a multicultural <laughs> mega church. She hosts the television show Paula White today. So you've got quotes from Sky Cleary, uh, Skylar White and Paula White. OK, as what we'll do is we'll go to your answer first of all, Ollie and Greg, and then Sky can give her answer because she'll probably know her own quotes. OK, um, m- much better than you do. Which know thyself and all that jazz. The Pen- points don't we'll matter see. anyway, Jake. The points do matter, <laughs> Ollie, and I appreciate you. It, not, um, do we win a quiz. jumper? Um, do you win a jumper? OK, we'll play for a jumper. There you no, go. Right. A sweatshirt. That's, as they that's say, more like it. Yeah. Saying the shirt, OK, so your first quotation. Someone has to protect this family from the man who protects this family. I'm going to go with the breaking bag lady. Sky. What do you reckon, Greg? I think... You have to edit out the white noise here so you can okay. take it as long as you like. I think it was the breaking bad chap as well. Okay, Sky. Woman, sorry. I'm going to go with breaking bad. Uh, there you go. One point to everybody there. That was too easy. Being alone is still a problem in our society. I'm going to go um, the the pasta lady, um, mm. White. I'm going to say Sky Cleary. What do you think, Sky? Uh, I think I'm going to go Paula. Did I say that? It is uh, It is yourself. It's Sky oh. Cleary, taken out of context from one of your talks. <laughs> who, who got the points there? Oh. Greg. Uh, Greg got the points. Greg a 2-1-1. The, one, one. the most basic question of all cannot be answered. Who are you? Mm. I'm going to go... The pastor the lady again. I also think it's the pastor. <laughs> I'm going to go for the pastor as well. It's the pastor there. Oh, so uh, what's that? Three, two, two. If you're here to find happiness or the secret of love, I'm sorry. Not going to happen to you. You should probably leave now. Uh, I'm going to go Scott Cleary. I've got to throw a curveball in there somewhere, oh, haven't I? Oh, you stick in with Scott oh, Cleary. Yeah, no, I'll stick with Not it, to yeah. infringe on your freedom, Ollie. I think that's the pastor again. <laughs> It sounds like Sky? something I would say. 
yeah okay i'm gonna say um yeah i um yeah i'm gonna go with me Yes, it was sky clear. Okay. Did, what did you say again, Greg? Sorry, I'm not. I said the pasta. Okay, you've all got the. You got this right. You got sky clear. Okay, so where are we? Sorry, I'm losing track of my own scores here. Three, With three, three. Three, three, three. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so we'll play. We'll do a couple more here. There's no better place to talk about love than a cozy lounge or summery rooftop over potions compounded by the world's best mixologists. Oh, um, I'm gonna go Breaking Bad because that's got. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Crystal Mate. Yeah, mix it. Yeah, it might be one. the actress, or it might be uh, Skylar White there as well. So it could be out oh, of the show. So, oh right. Yeah, the, you know these are just anything <laughs> so which it just could came. Be the character it can, or the actress. It depends whether they're playing the role of the actress in good faith or You've not. Still got to make a decision. I though, think but. it's the actress who plays the character, then not the character. Okay, and Sky. I said that. She has got <laughs> that. <laughs> That's four, three, three. And we'll play a final one here. I'm not a gambler, let's just say that, nor have I ever been a dealer at a casino. Uh, I'm going to go the pasta. <laughs> I should that's, hope that that's that funny. hasn't been a dealer at a casino. I think that is the actress again, not the character. Ah, and Sky? I'm going to say Skylar. There you go. It is the actress uh, who plays Skylar. So you're out of the running here, Rolly. Oh, well. So you can only get a draw. I'm going to give one final one here. Nobody's all good or bad, and nobody's all light or dark. Every human being has so many different aspects and facets to them, and there can be something noble and something really dark and dangerous going on in a person all at the same time. Ooh. Ominous. That's a tough one. Ollie. I'm not in it anymore. Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm you're radically go... free. You can just jump in the. Okay, quest. I'm going to go with. You're not that free. You no. can't take that much time, okay. Greg. <laughs> I will go with the pasta. And Sky. Yeah, me too. You go with the. I'm afraid you're both wrong. So it's a draw between <laughs> Greg and Sky. Uh, Greg, you've got a jump their sweatshirt already. So Sky will send you over a pan cast sweatshirt over in over in the post because you've won today's quiz. Oh, great! Thank you. Um. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, in particular, Jim Clare. We're going to continue the conversation, me, Greg and Ollie, over into the after show next, where we're going to be talking about, once I've found my notes, book recommendations. We'll be talking about behind the scenes at the Pan Psychast, such as our upcoming trip to the United States. We're going to find out whether Ollie and Greg will be dying alone. And we'll also be talking <laughs> about uh, the hit TV show, The Good Place, as well, and playing some more pop pop philosophy quiz. So head over to patreon.com forward slash Pan if you want to hear us continue the conversation and play some games. Uh, last plug for sweatshirts here. We might be running out now, and you're probably too late if you're listening to this two days before before Christmas Day, but Merry Christmas to you anyway. Why don't you start the new year off in the right way, embrace your radical freedom and look like everybody else that listens to the show and buy <laughs> yourself a Pansycast sweatshirt. Links to all of Sky's work can be found on our website, thepansycast.com, as well as in the iTunes description. That's www.skyclery.com. You can also follow Sky on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash sky underscore cleary. And you can find a link to Sky's book, Existentialism and Romantic Love, which comes highly recommended by us all on our website. And there's also a link in the iTunes description for that. We can't recommend it enough. And there's also some copies on our social media page, which you can be in for a chance of winning. Thank you. You've been listening to the beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Mr. Gregory Milley. Thank Mr. you. Sorry, after Millie, sorry. Mr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Dr. Sky Cleary. Thank you so much. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>